the thing that has occurred to us is that frequently in the church, um, by the church I mean the church of history, the church capital C, not the church small c, um, the church in history um, has had this emphasis on personal holiness and personal growth in and personal relationship with God, uh, which is absolutely essential. But if we understand um, if we understand the true nature of what God is and God has done, is that man was never, as we saw in our brief study of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, a man was never ever designed to live in isolation or to survive as an individual, but always in relationship. Uh, therefore, an absolutely critical component of your spiritual maturity is the extent to which you are prepared to be in conscious, fulfilling, productive relationship with other people in the, in the body of Christ first and then in the wider sense with those around us in the world. Uh, as Seth and I discussed this, um, Seth was um, reminding me that of an experience he'd had in Bible school and uh, how that one of his professors talked a great deal about servanthood. And as we were talking about uh, Jesus and the fact that Jesus came as a servant not as a leader. It's, you know, the kingdom of God is constantly upside down. Uh, and how you don't just have to um, read business journals or political journals or watch the news uh, to see how people are clamoring to be at the front of the line. You see it every day in the Christian community. People fighting, vying, jockeying for prominence, for visibility, for leadership roles, for affirmation. We have this amazing account. Um, <laughs> the disciples have been walking with Jesus. They're with him pretty much 24-7 for about two or two and a half years. It's really very close to the, the big event, meaning his arrest, trial, crucifixion, resurrection, getting very, very close. About it looks like about 80, 85 percent of the time that they have with Jesus has already occurred. And on, on this occasion, as a getting close to Jerusalem, Jesus sees that these guys are talking among each other. There are two, actually two stories. One, of course, is the mother who comes to Jesus and says, uh, what I'd really like to have you do is assure me that, you know, my sons are going to have in heaven the right hand and the left hand. Now, in a sense, in a sense, you could dismiss that. You know, that's the typical mother wanting the best for her boys. Uh, but there is this incident very close to the big event when Jesus sees the disciples are talking among themselves, and it's a pretty heated exchange. And he says, what were you talking about? <laughs> and what was it they were talking about? 
Who is going to be the greatest? And uh, Seth was telling about, about this professor, had this wonderful, wonderful line. In the kingdom of God, there is al always, always plenty of room at the back of the line because that's where you'll find Jesus. So, um, a natural part of personal discipleship and discipline is not just how do I relate to Jesus, but it's how I relate to others. So we're not here, first of all, talking about methodology. We're first of all here talking about mindset and spiritual journey. Where are you personally? It is who you are, how you see God, how you see others around you, how you actually conduct your YWAM affairs, whether you're a street musician, whether you're IWT team, whether you work at the University of the Nations. What is your mindset with regard to God, the kingdom, and his people? Now, if you have the right mindset in an IWT, you come to serve the body of Christ in the city. Uh, okay, we're going to try to see if we can uh, get going here. I want to see if I can get this guy on. And I want to use, just tell you a story. I alluded to it. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, I would be helpful if I. <laughs> the British have a phrase for this commanding grasp of the obvious. Um, I just want to take a few minutes at the beginning before we actually get into, you know, content all that much and um, unpack a story which I started uh, yesterday. In 1986, 87, 85, 86, 87, you'll remember there was this great revolution in the Soviet Empire called Perestroika and Glasnost. Um, Brezhnev and then Gorbachev and all those amazing things that happened. And out of one great polyglot nation came 16 countries that eventually within five years were 16 autonomous sovereign nations. Uh, one of the nations which had been not a part of the Soviet Union, but had been a socialist client state of the Soviet Union was Outer Mongolia. It was largely a barter or trade economy between the two. Um, the Soviet Union always had large numbers of troops stationed there because Mongolia was very well positioned with regard to China, and the Soviet government was always concerned about the relationship with China. And as is true even today, now um, 15, 18 years later, you can go to Ulaanbaatar, the capital, and you still see this vast jungle of neo-socialist architecture that's left over from the days of the Soviets. When Perestroika and Glasnost came, uh, Mongolia, which was largely isolated from the outside world, had the second highest gross national product per capita of any nation in Asia. Uh, it was second only uh, to Japan. It was ahead of all of the other Asian tigers, Taiwan, Philippines, and so forth. But nobody, it was not a player on the world stage. It had the second highest literacy rates in all of Asia, second only to Japan. Now both its GNP and its literacy rates have plummeted since 1986. But because of perestroika and, and the fact that the, the ties, economic ties were breaking between the Soviet Union 
the old Soviet Union and Mongolia, people understood that it was going to be opening up for the very first time. Uh, so in 98 and 99, people came to us and said, uh, some of us have had a lot of experience in difficult places like Afghanistan and Nepal, which have been closed in the past, and as ministries have come together with the IAM in Afghanistan and the UM and United Mission to Nepal, you know, there were days, there was 25 years when YWAM and OM and all these mission could not even get into Nepal. Why, anything that YWAM did in Nepal was because they were a member of a thing called the United Mission to Nepal. And what we see going on in Nepal today with the tremendous growth of the church is largely because for over 25 years, God's people worked together in a thing called the United Mission to Nepal. Now today, frankly, Nepal is a mess in terms of the church. Divisions, fighting, turf wars, egos, kingdoms and empires, and it now reflects what the church looked like around the world. For 25 years, it was extraordinary. Uh, there was one voice and everybody worked together. So people who were doing those things said, we see Mongolia coming, can you help us? They asked, we, we don't know how to do this, but you guys, the partnership people, can you help us do this? We prayed and talked and prayed and talked and we said, okay, we'll try to help. Um, at the time, my colleagues were doing other things and I decided that we decided that I should be the one who would do at least the exploration work on this. I spent 18 months and what I had to do was exactly what you have to do in a city. I had to figure out, first of all, we had to figure out who are the players because at that time there were only four known believers Four. You think you got a problem in Malaga? There were four known believers in all of Mongolia. There were two, two, count them, expatriates. Four believers and two Christian ex expatriates in the country in 1991. One was a Finnish journalist and the other was a very eccentric British linguist. Uh, <clears throat> so there was no history in the previous 50, 60 years there was no history of mission work at all actually inside, inside uh, Mongolia so where do you start? you think you have a problem in, in, in Cape Town? you think you've got a problem in Dayton? I mean what, what, how are you going to develop a collaborative initiative in a country where nobody's doing anything? So he spent 18 months finding out who was interested in Mongolia. Was there any agency that had some historical linkage to the country to Mongolian people? Because there was a large Mongolian diaspora in Moscow, in Hungary, as students, and inner Mongolia <coughs> was accessible through China because it was a Chinese province. Greatly condensed the story. We spent 18 months, identified about 16 different ministries. We personally, personally, you know, I have placed great emphasis during this exploration stage, and if you've read page 141 through around 160, um, which I'm sure you did very diligently last night after that uh, Cold Stone ice cream, uh, which, you know, got your mind going, um, you were underlining and all that stuff. Why are we laughing here? I mean, <laughs> um, I spell out in there, uh, the, 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 the kind of careful way we go out and talk to people, how we listen to people. We've talked here already a lot about listening to people, what you say and don't say. And so we spent 18 months going around listening to people. Now one of the big problems you face in your IWT is you show up in town and you go out and you call on the church or you call on a business person or you call on a person who's in education in the city who's a believer or you call on somebody who's in the media and they say, who are you? Why are you here? You're a stranger, you're a foreigner, why are you asking me about this stuff? Who asked you to come here? They're really saying, what authority do you have? Why are you so presumptuous to think you can come here and they tell us what to do or show us something? So. I mean, I, because I was raised on the border with Mexico and I spent a lot of time, you know, my life overseas, 
long, long ago, I understood the cross of being an American. And as a journalist, I had to deal with that, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. So when I would sit down with, you know, a mission agency leader in Denmark or a mission agency leader in Holland or Germany or Britain or Australia, I understood that they were, the very fact that I showed up as an American, they, they made the following assumptions. A, he's got some big new idea and he's going to want us to participate. He's going to call it partnership, but what he really wants is us to help him do his thing. And probably what's going to happen is if I don't say yes the first time, I'll never see the guy again. Now, why do you think they think that? It's strange, isn't it? It's never happened before. Why would they think that? <laughs> and guess what they're going to say when you kind of start calling on them in Malaga or Cape Town? Who are you? Why are you here? Will I ever see you again? What does this really mean? Is it you want me to join your deal so you can get the glory? So all these things are perfectly legitimate. Uh, over a period of 18 months, I wound up having to go back in some cases two or three times. Now listen, friends, this is not working in a city. You, you heard me tell, tell you the day before yesterday that I personally believe the city is the last great frontier. It's the most complex, challenging human organism in the world. But it is comparatively simple to get in your car or on the metro or on a bus and go across town and spend two hours over coffee with somebody. It's a lot more complicated when you have to get on an airplane and fly to Finland. Because these 16 agencies were in nine different countries. They're all over the world. And 95% of these people I had never even laid eyes on before. They didn't know who I was. They knew nothing about my organization at all. I walked in with zero credibility. No history, no relationship, no nothing. You're starting from just absolutely the bottom. So in some cases, I had to go back two or three times. That means just, you know, it doesn't, that's not advanced mathematics. That <laughs> means before the very first meeting was ever called, <coughs> I had had between 50 and 60, 50 and 60 personal one-on-one -on -one meetings with people. You know, and this is flying to Finland or to Denmark or to Australia and spending, you know, three days, four days just to get to see the person, spend four hours or five hours with the person, and then three months later coming back again. Before, the, before a written notice invitation was sent up for the first meeting, I had nearly 40,000 US dollars in cash that had been spent just on airplane tickets, hotel bills, taxi cabs, telexes, and that kind of stuff. I had absolutely nothing to show for it. I mean, not anything you put your newsletter, you know, <laughs> prayer letter saying. Look at what God has done. You know. This is definitely what an industry you call below the line costs. Now I'm just telling you the story, friends. This is not the only time. I've been through this a lot of times. This happens to be one of the most highly visible ones that has had some amazing outcomes since, by God's grace. What did we uncover during all of these visits? We uncovered a sordid, pathetic, tragic mess. First of all, people had bad ideas about what was going on in Mongolia. People had distorted impressions of what could happen there. 
And most of all, what we found out was that, that Satan, even though no one had ever actually physically worked inside the country for 25, 30, 40 years, people had been praying, talking, praying, talking, doing all kinds of stuff about Mongolia, and impressions about who was doing what and wanting to do what and what their motivations were had grown up. I knew nothing about this. I walked into this rat's nest of terrible, broken, horrific relationships. I found people who hated each other, did not trust each other, were lying about each other, slander. These are Christian leaders, friends. Now you say, how in the world, how in the world can this be? We have this kind of idealistic view. People come to Jesus, they love Jesus, and they love everybody else. What did we say in the beginning? We said in the beginning that Genesis 1, 2, and 3 make it very clear that Satan's primary mission is to destroy relationships, destroy our trust in God, destruction of relationship with God, with myself, with others, the created order, and with eternity. And he still haunts us like a roaring lion seeking to destroy everything. He does not have to get you involved in sexual sin. You do not have to run away with a million dollars of God's money. You do not have to do any of these really highly visible things. All you have to do is not trust God, not trust your brothers, as long as he can keep the body of Christ divided, he has won. The war is over. That's why, that's why in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the second chapter, if you read it in some of the more contemporary translations, it says, you know, you who are far from God, he's talking about the Gentiles, and those of us who were near to God were at war with each other. He concludes that fabulous passage in Ephesians 2 by saying this, then he sent Jesus to those of you who were far from God and to those of us who were near to tell us that what? That the war was over. Those words are used explicitly in the Greek, that the war was over. And what I <laughs> uncovered you know, in this in this exploration phase for this partnership was that the war was very much alive. Uh, and you're going to find a lot of that. So it, what do we draw from what I've said so far about the Mongolia experience? First of all, it was research, diligent research. Every person I went to see, I asked, who else should I be talking to? <clears throat> it was exploring. Who are you? What is your history? What have you done? What are your dreams for Mongolia? I had nothing to say. All I could do was listen and questions. Who else should I be talking to? Now, there was one other thing I should comment on. The broken relationships were clearly the result of Satan's work, but they were uh, it's like pouring petrol on the fire. The natural tendency, once you have a broken relationship, is to want to talk about the broken relationship. See, one of the most critical things the people in your city are going to be asking themselves is, if I share my confidence with this brother or with this sister, will it come back to haunt me? Now, you know, I would go to visit some of these guys and they would tell me their impression of certain other people. Or they would tell me their impression of what had happened in a certain situation. And if two months later, or three months later, I came back, I can guarantee you that one of the most critical things on the mind of the person when I came back was whether or not during the two or three months I had been gone, 
they had heard from someone else that I had reported what they had said. So let me just encourage you, friends, IWT teams must be known for absolute, total integrity. Eyes wide open, ears wide open, hearts wide open, and mouths shut. You must, must, must keep the confidence of God's people. As soon as you betray a person's confidence, that relationship is lost. So every time they came back, these people knew. I mean, they had not heard, they had not even heard a word. Maybe they heard, you know, they check around because they have their friends. Has this guy been, Phil Butler been to see you? Has Tony been to see you? Has Angelica come to see you? What did she say? What they're looking for is, did they talk about me? Did they tell you what I told them? And they better be able to hear back, you know, they told me about this vision. Well, did they mention they had been to see me? Well, yeah, they said they had been to see you. Did they tell you anything about our conversation? Did not tell me a thing about their conversation with you. And in, in doing this and approaching it this way, gaining information, exploring history, and the be beginning, very small beginning of building relationships. Trust. Asking questions, listening, and keeping my mouth shut. Now, <clears throat> when we actually called finally after 18 months, decided, yeah, there appears to be enough interest, as I mentioned yesterday, we called a meeting. It was held at the Salisbury Road YMCA in Hong Kong. If you've been in Hong Kong, you know the Salisbury Road right down by the Star Ferry. This was the old days before they completely rebuilt the YMCA. We had 74 people show up. And it was a shock you know, because we had sent out, they had, we couldn't see everyone. I mean, you can't call on 70 people. I mean, not around the world. But 74 people showed up and uh, I'm going to try to greatly condense this story. Uh, the, we had basically, we had two agendas going from the beginning to the end. One was because we had uncovered this terrible, it was like a, like a frightening, terrifying, bad dream. Because we had uncovered these broken relationships, um, we just felt it would be impossible. You could never d build enough trust in working together to ever have any kind of real partnership. You, it was impossible. These people hated each other. And I told Seth, you know, the very first morning, <laughs> my wife and I arrived there in Hong Kong two days before the event, trying to get ready. We're staying in the Salisbury Road YMCA, and all night long, the last two nights before the meeting started, we had this unbelievable demonic activity. I mean, we had, we had demons in our room. I mean, it was horrific stuff. We were on our knees pleading the blood of Christ for protection. You know, even among good Pentecostals, when I say these kind of things, a lot of times people will go, oh, whoa, what is this about? And, but I've been a few places in the world, and that was one of the most, I've seen guys die in front of firing squads. I dodged the bullets in Vietnam as a journalist, not as a soldier. I've, I drove racing cars for four to Great Britain. I know what it is to be terrified out of your mind because of what you yourself have decided to do. I can tell you, friends, there is nothing, nothing in the world is as terrifying as looking Satan in the eye. Bone chilling, blood curdling, absolute terror. 
ask the Lord to protect you from any such encounters. And our worst dreams came true when the first morning we went down, you know, at 6.30 in the morning to the coffee shop. Meeting's supposed to start at 8 o'clock. And here are all these people, the different factions, the different warring camps, sitting in the different corners of the coffee shop. Already, you could see them planning, you know, their strategy, what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. I mean, it was just, I mean, <laughs> oh, Lord. This is hopeless. I mean, what in the world are we going to do here? So we had two, two themes. One was we were trying to come out at the end and give them, because I, I didn't know what was needed to be done in Mongolia. I just knew that if God's people were going to I didn't know if he actually wanted the partnership to go together then. Were we actually the right people? Was this his time? You cannot dictate those things. But we were committed to seeing, giving them the best possible opportunity. But we knew that we had to be consciously active, not only working on that partnership process, but on the relationship problem. You know, nobody else had worked on the relationship problem. You cannot sweep this stuff under the table. Now, if you're in a city, you have a lot better opportunity because you have greater access to people. You can begin re reconciliation processes before you get into these meetings. Because you uncover these problems and you can get senior godly people engaged and begin to work on these problems before you ever show up in a meeting where you have confrontations. We didn't have that luxury. We had to do the meeting, <laughs> but we also had to work on the relationship. So we had a group of people around the world praying 24-7 praying the blood of Christ over Salisbury Road YMCA, protecting us from Satan's work. Second, I had the head of then the World Evangelical Alliance, a guy by the name of David Howard, came up from Singapore and we had these teams, three teams of two people each who were experienced at reconciliation and restoration of relationships and counseling. And for three nights, we ran four days, three nights. The meetings ran from eight o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock every night. Long, tough days. See, it takes time to do what you want to do in a city. You don't call a two-hour meeting over coffee and accomplish what you want to accomplish. Forget it. So here we are now, you know, in the daytime, dealing with all the issues that had to be dealt with regarding ministry and partnership. At night, starting at 9, 9.30 in the evening until 5 or 6 the next morning, all three nights, all three teams, are doing nothing but meeting and praying with people all night long. This was a very conscious, deliberate, direct attempt to, re to reconcile people so that people could work together in the name of Jesus. Now you say, I didn't, you know, I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. Well, if you're not, I'm not saying you personally have to do that, but your team must come to grips with those kinds of issues because you will face, not necessarily the way we did there, but you will face in your cities relationships where people are unwilling to trust each other. There's history, there are problems, there are issues. Well, bottom line is by God's grace at the end of the day, <coughs> we got enough, we got enough trust. We got enough restoration of relationships so that the people, we didn't tell them what to do, they chose, they believed that they could go forward in some kind of collaborative effort. And if we had tried to artificially manipulate some kind of outcome, give them a formula, prescribe how it was going to be done, it would have ended in absolute ruins. So <clears throat> there were facts we had to know, there was action we had to take, and there were relationships we had to address. So those are some of the things that you will be faced with. Now here's a question I want to ask. Um, real quickly, do you remember these points? This is where we were going. 
we said we wanted to look at the fact that IWG is based on partnership, that partnership was God's design, is not <laughs> Phil Butler's idea, <laughs> heaven help us, that there are real roadblocks, but there are real benefits. We talked about those things. We talked about what are the key points in your IWT initiative. We talked yesterday in some detail in the morning about spiritual change, the evangelism process. We talked about what the qualities of effective partnerships are. Now we're beginning to talk in more detail about the actual toolkit. What do you have to know? What do you have to do to make this work? And eventually, by tomorrow afternoon, we want to be talking about your action plan. Here's a question for you. Both. All three. Or both, or any other observations, comments? The second one is more all-encompassing because if you have that in place, the outcome would be salvation because the vision will be um, grasped by the, the, um, the locals and everyone will have ownership and then you have the end result of salvation. But if you focus on the event and salvation alone, then um, the lifespan and the, the depth of it is going to be shallow. So I think it's much more important to dig deep and hammer on the second one, then you can have, have the outcome of the first one. Any other observations? I think the question that you asked uh, earlier on, what would uh, my city look like um, you know, in five years' time if the kingdom of God has come? And so I think that should be the goal for any partnership or... Uh, you know, any effort to see, you know, Christ glorified, if it's through evangelism, through discipling. And uh, so I think that would be my, you know, my comment on that. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time here. This is, I hope this becomes, I know it is a matter of conversation with your groups already. Here's my observation. The reason I like IWT is because I think by doing the first two things and the event, the tour itself, the week or 10 days or whatever it is, we already know, we've discussed, you have the timeline and we've talked about the steps involved. It's part of a process. It happens to be a highly visible thing. Eventually it becomes very visible in the community. But by, by doing this event, through a process and engaging God's people together, you demonstrate. See, it's one thing to talk. Don't talk about love, show me. Don't talk about Christian unity, show me the benefits. So one of the, the most powerful, it seems like to me, that one of the most powerful legacies that you bring is by helping God's people come together and have the, the initial or the first fruits of that be 5,000, 4,000, 10,000 people who come to Christ. And the other benefits that immediately come to the city, you give them hope, you give them hope, and you give them ideas regarding structure of how they can go on and do greater things. Just to affirm that many of the pastors in Fiji, that's what they said. Now we know, now we want to use your track so we know how to work together for the first time. So that was very encouraging. Okay. 
Okay, very quickly, I want to run through what we did last night, which was um, what are we really doing here, uh, trust, and then we're going to talk very specifically about um, addressing the issue of meetings and how we do these key elements of exploration formation. We said we need to know the city, its realities, its influentials. We need to establish a prayer base. We need to build relationships of trust and vision, facilitate meetings, define leadership and the actual structures. We need to define success, both the long-term vision and immediate and near-term goals so we can share success and know whether or not we are on target. When you play a game of golf, it's the end score that counts. But the end score comes hole by hole by hole. And you're adding the score as you go. It provides you a road map whether or not you're headed towards success or failure. The course, every course in the world has what they call PAR, P-A-R. That means that's the standard high average. That's the goal to shoot for. Now we can do equal to the par, we can shoot under par, which is superior, or we can go over par, which is less than superior. But unless we have whole by whole by whole progress report, we have no idea where we, where we are on the journey. <clears throat> we have to agree on who's doing what, when it's going to happen, how will we be accountable to each other, and how will we communicate? Why do most organizations fail? Why do most marriages fail? Well, certainly a key issue always is what? Communication, right? Monitor, coach, and encourage, celebrate your success, share the credit, put these longer term goals in place, and hopefully the churches own and have this vision for long term transformation. Now, we talked last night about the importance of trust in three things. What? In people. People leading the IW2 in initiative and between, trust between the parties, probably not in the beginning, but hopefully because of what you do in the IWT process, the trust between the partners goes up. That's one of the wonderful things you leave behind in terms of your legacy. Trust in the purpose. We're actually in this together because we believe in what we're doing, both the big vision and what we're trying to do in the next 60 days. And trust in the process. We know that we can trust these people. They have integrity. We have full access. We have there's consistency in promise and performance. Uh, now, and I, we went through a lot of the details of each one of those things. We talked about the building blocks of trust and trusting people. We talked about building blocks of trusting the purpose. We talked building blocks of trusting the process. Okay. Now, what I want to do is very quickly kind of segue to the issue of meetings because I want to raise these primary issues and then before coffee and then uh, afterwards and put you to work kind of unpacking your stuff. You want to have effective meetings? You have to have <laughs> meetings, whether you like it or not. You have to have meetings in, in your IWT stuff. You have to bring people around the table, maybe committee meetings, maybe larger group meetings, uh, particularly in the early stages. When you don't know everyone, they don't know each other, they're unfamiliar with your team, they're unfamiliar with how this thing works, uh, they have no experience uh, doing this kind of thing. <clears throat> First of all, you, you and all the participants need to know the meeting purpose. Don't call a meeting unless you know why you're calling the meeting. When you call the meeting, at the end of the time, what do you want to have happened? What do you want to accomplish? The more specific, the more specific your goals are, the more likely are it is you're going to achieve those. Now, you need to know that, and the participants who are coming need to know that. You remember I told you the story about the meeting in the south of France, how we sent out the meeting agenda or the schedule in advance, three weeks in advance, so people could see what, 
those, we try to minimize the surprises, maximize the productivity. Yes? It's coming from two directions here. Stereo. Um, my question is, so the last story that you told about Mongolia, obviously there was problems there, but how did you address that? Because you said you wanted to let them know the <coughs> purpose in advance, and obviously part of your purpose was to get them to reconcile. The truth is, the truth is, Jessica, I didn't, you know, I didn't kind of give them the two agendas. Oh, okay. I gave them the main agenda, which was the partnership and how we were going to do that. And I'll, I'll unpack that for you, what we did there. That was kind of the public part. Because you can't deal, you, you cannot effectively deal with relationships publicly. You cannot do that. It's death. It's death. So you don't want to announce to people, you know what, there's a real mess out there. <laughs> and you know, if you show up here, count on it. We're going to have you up from 9 p.m. until 6 the next morning solving this problem. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um. So the agenda we sent out dealt, dealt more with the facts and what, you know, ministry things and the kind of issues we're going to have to deal with, and I'm going to unpack that for you in a little while. Okay, you might be unpacking this also. Um, how did you even get them there if they didn't want to work with the other people? Like, what did you say to them? Uh, frankly, by the time we got to that point, there was a lot of, I don't want to be left out kind of stuff. See, the prob one of the problems at that time was there was no access to the country. Uh, almost no expatriates had actually been inside the country. And it was a kind of black box. And there was a feeling that, you know, this was going to be a time where people were going to learn a lot about both what was maybe going on, and it was kind of, you know, even if, you know, because a lot of people, there were a lot of people, if they do show up, at your, say, you go out and talk to them, and they've been maybe indifferent or passive. <clears throat> you, they sh do not do not take a great deal of <laughs> encouragement just for, because they show up. People frequently will show up just to make sure they don't miss the train. They come, basically, what they, they do it physically, in their minds, they come with their arms folded. Show me. I don't want to miss anything. If so-and-so is going to take leadership or these groups are going to get together, I want to make sure we're not left out. I mean, it's all that stuff. It has to do with ego and turf. And all that stuff is present, even in the kind of the best of situations. Well, we didn't say it in the mailings. I mean, we didn't get actually, we, I don't, I, honestly, I don't remember, Jessica, if we, if we sent out the list of who was being invited. I think we may have because by then, the actual list of agencies was maybe up to 30, even though we'd only call in 16. Um, again, it comes back to the thing we were discussing last night. If you know there are 25 churches in the city, and you're trying to get your IWT off the ground, and you identify the fact by cross-referencing. You ask, 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 and you get it down, you finally find that there are four or five pastors that are perceived to be the most influential. Uh, those are the guys, you need to get at least three or four of those five or six guys on board. You don't need all of them. Uh, so uh, we didn't have to speak all, with all 30 agencies. You know, as, as we did our research, we kept you know, getting the cross-references, the same names kept showing up. Those become the people I had to call on. Those were the 16. So, yeah, I think we probably did, because that's generally the policy. I mean, that we send out what we're going to do and who we expect to be there, a registration list. Um, but, and I think we said something like, you know, maximum two people per agency or something like that. And there are always some people who drift in. They just show up. You know, word on the street. It happens. They will happen with you. You talk with people, you build expectation, and word gets out on the street, and people say, I don't want to miss something. You know? uh, and they're curious, so they show up. But yeah, full disclosure is really critical. Because 
again, as we said, you do it in advance, give them a chance to, to give input. You know, it depends. Every situation is a bit different, but uh, this is a general principle. You have to tailor it to your local situation. And then when you come together, sit down and go over it again. What that says to people is, they said they were going to do this, now they're doing it. See what I'm saying? It's just so important. Consistency. What they're looking for is that there are no hidden tricks. Get input in advance. Know the mind of the participants. Minimize the surprises. If, there's been, if there have been fights, if there have been things in the past in your city, you better know about them. Because what you do not want to have happen when you get your first 5, 10, 15, 20 most influential people in the city in the room, you don't want somebody to bring up something that you don't know about. And frankly, there are, uh, you wish this wasn't true <laughs> among believers. Uh, frankly, my experience in business is that many times, except like in stockholder meetings, or there may be a lot of rancor. Uh, Christian people, there, there seems to be a, they have a habit of trying to play a card publicly that demonstrates they know something. And usually the card they want to play is a, it's a bad card. It shows that they're privileged, they have privileged information about something. It's trying to sort of position themselves as an authority or in the know or part of the center circle or something. Count on it. And if it happens, what you need to know is you, you know about that. Or you know about the relationship with the Assemblies of God and this Lutheran guy over here, and there was this problem three years ago. So you can say, <clears throat> brother or sister, I think we're all aware that here in Malaga or Dayton or something, there have been issues in the past. That's, that's the nature of God, the nature of the work. If you would like to discuss that in more detail, I'd be glad to meet with you over coffee. That's the end of it, right there. Move on. That's not why we're here. You're not gonna, <laughs> you will not know all the skeletons, but you better know the big ones. Encourage participation by all. When you get people in the meeting, you actually have to call people. Rahel, what do you think about this? Because, you know, you always, always, you know, you always have two, three, four, or five people who want to dominate everything. You can't let that happen. You've got to proactively engage people. I mean, it's one thing about facilitation of meetings. It's not for the faint-hearted and timid. You know, you really do have to be prepared that if you've got some, and I mean, I've, all of you have had this experience. I mean, I've had meetings where I've had one person who won't stop, you know, they just won't shut up. I've, I have, in the middle of meetings, said, brother or sister, thank you very much for your input. What a, I would really appreciate it if for the next few minutes you allow the rest of the people here in the room to participate. I've actually had some groups clap when you do that, because the people themselves are sick of it. And some people are so incredibly insensitive. I mean, it's just, they love to hear themselves talk. I mean, it's just like they're on another planet, like they're in some other place, you know? And they're, but their body's here, but they're like, you know. <laughs> Define the timelines for discussion. If you have an agenda, think in advance. You know, what's it going to take? Let me just say, on this uh, encourage participation by all, in the book, you may have looked at this and you said, what in the world is this? It's totally bizarre. Uh, let me get a page number here. Um, thought I had this turned down. What are the effective meetings? P 
page 172. You want to turn to page 172? You look at this bizarre looking chart, diagram, not chart. Now this may sound very strange to you, but this is a fact. I'm not making this up. I still have in my files, I still have in my files this chart on a yellow pad, which I actually did prior to the first meeting at the Salisbury Road YMCA in Hong Kong. I actually sat down with a chart three days in advance and did a chart like this by hand, just roughed it out, quick and dirty. Why did I do that? I had the agenda on one side, I had an empty page on the other side, I said, how am I going to get people engaged? And all this is, it's a very simple thing, but it actually walks you through the process. Starting at the bottom, advanced one-on-one -on -one exploration discussions, agreement for exploration meeting, circulate draft agenda and request input. Revise the agenda and form some kind of advisory group. Why do you want an advisory group? It's not a decision-making group. It's an advisory group that comes in that are respected, you may use the term elders, there are people who are already, in a sense, non-controversial. They are respected people. They may be only three or four. One of the nicest things to do at the very beginning is when you can stand up and say, I'm not making all the decisions here. You know, we have this advisory group. That's all they are right now. They are helping us in listening to what God is saying, listening to what you're saying, and advising us on this process. So if you have something you want to say, please, it's confidential, speak to them. They are peers. Then, you know, meeting starts, devotion, small group prayer, and what you see there are little groups of people. <laughs> Those circles are, <laughs> Those are people. <laughs> Come back together, review and agree on the agenda. That's a plenary meeting. Next we're going to talk, and when we talk about going through the meeting, we're going to talk about who are you, what do you do, what are your individual hopes and dreams, or ministry hopes and dreams. And I'm going to walk through that when I talk you through the building blocks of an effective meeting. Again, you see individual people speaking. We go through this, so the whole day is, it's just, an, all this is is an attempt to try to in advance think about how will I engage people in the process. To what extent will I actually give people a chance to talk? And that's why the structure, the way I actually do this stuff is so important because not everyone will ever speak up in a, in a complete meeting. But everyone needs to be heard. Otherwise, there, there's not going to be a sense of participation. And frankly, you will not get the richness of, and the diversity and the depth of understanding you need to have. Because there are a lot of people in the room who are very bright, have a great deal to contribute, but they simply cannot engage publicly in a, in a larger group. But you give them a group of two or three, and you give them a specific thing to do, they'll work very well and make a significant contribution. Does that make any sense? That's what that's all about there. It's all it is. It's just a kind of, for instance, it's a kind of idea. It kind of shows you can actually sit down and consciously think in advance, how am I going to organize this time? So I'm proactive. I'm actually intentional and in thinking about how I engage God's people in the process. Define time limits. You know, there are some of the things in this process, and we actually get into the details of the meeting, there are some of the things in the meeting that are a lot more important than others. And you say, well, I think this, uh, we ought to allow 30 minutes for this. Now, once in a while, you will get into a situation where, where somebody in the group or a small group within the group or the whole group will sort of rise up and they will say, to each other and to you, we think we need to take more time on this. You better listen. You know, if you've allocated 20 minutes to this and about 18 minutes into it, the discussion is going hot and heavy, and they say, you know, we think we need more time, you better give them more time. 
And that's why you need to be flexible and able to change as you go along. We're not seeking. <coughs> we are not seeking uniformity. You will never, ever. God help us. You know, read you know, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. Diversity of gifts, diversity of views, diversity of roles in the kingdom. You know, you're not going to have a guy who's running a rescue mission or a woman who's doing you know, midnight walks with prostitutes in the city going to be looking at life and what ought to be done the same way that a person who's running youth camps or pastor of a local church or a person, a Christian journalist. What we're seeking is consensus about what God wants done and what transformation of the city would look like spiritually. You are going to have controversial issues emerge. I don't care how much work you've done in advance, how hard you've tried to explore the skeletons, they will come out. Do not be shocked. You may, in your heart of hearts, I've had so many times, you know, you try to remain peaceful on the surface, <laughs> like you're perfectly calm. You're facilitating this process. <laughs> and something comes up and you just, you know, <coughs> you know, it strikes terror to your heart. You think, uh-oh, this is it. Uh, I don't care, it may be a relational issue, it may be a theological issue, Uh, it may be a process issue. I think we need more time. Uh, I think uh, we need to add this to the agenda. Uh, anytime you find yourself in the facilitation of a process like this and something comes up that you do not feel comfortable with at the moment, I strongly recommend you write in front of everyone you're very candid. You say, that's an important topic. I'm sure it's a matter, probably not just a matter of concern to you. It may be a matter of concern to others. May I suggest, because here's what we're working on the agenda now, that at coffee or at the lunch break, you meet with the advisory team, or I'll be glad to meet with you and the advisory team. We'll talk about this. You've acknowledged the person. You've not dismissed them. You've given credibility to their concern, and you've given a mechanism to allow this issue to be dealt with so the person can be heard. And once in a while, once in a while, you go offline in the hallway or over lunch or over coffee with this person or with the person in the advisory group. The thing becomes clear, and it is important enough to bring back to the group. And so you come back to the group and you say, you may remember this morning, Jack over here raised this issue of so-and-so. During the break we had a discussion and we've decided that we do think it's a matter of significance for the whole group and we're going to put it in at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Make sure you all report back because people want to know that you're not sweeping stuff under the table. Have clear outcomes, objectives, roles, and timetables. Do follow up with everybody. Recap the outcomes. Here's what, here's what we plan to do. Here's what we did. And here's what we plan to do in the future. You know, um, <laughs> as I said the first day, we all, and we're on a journey, we always want to know where we are on the journey. That's why the highway department puts up signs. You know, it's 100 kilometers, then it's 60 kilometers, then it's 40 kilometers. It gives you a sense of assurance, A, that you're on the right road, you're not going backwards, <laughs> and there's a possibility of success. You may see it go down to five kilometers and two kilometers, and then you're there. So we need to recap for people what we've done. Comments, I'm going to now kind of walk through the process. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes here, but I've been going for a long time. Observations, thoughts from anything that's been said so far before we kind of get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of this stuff? Yes, Emily.
Um, I noticed one of the things, um, at least about working in the States, is that you have the different ministerial groups that are already formed together when you go into a city. Um, and of course, they're different, different backgrounds and different, different denominations. Um, what's your suggestion or thought about how to get those people together um, outside? Because we'll meet with one ministerial and then we'll meet with another one. But if we could bring them together sooner, I think it would be more effective. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions for that? Uh, yeah, if they, you know, some cities, as you know, have things like pastors' prayer fellowships that cut across those lines. And those in the United States, and I think it exists in some other places, Britain and Holland and other places, uh, that's sometimes a helpful group because it's a kind of mid <laughs> midway. Sometimes it can be a problem because they have perception that they have sort of control, spiritual control of a city. And we have to be careful because there is a sen certain sense in which they're right. They've been there a long time. They paid the price. Who are you? Uh, I would say that um, with regard to ministerial groups, like for example, you may have an association of evangelicals, you may have a council of churches. Um, some denominational groups, like the AOG, or Assemblies of God, may have a pastor's fellowship. Uh, it is very important that you acknowledge these people. It does not mean that you are subservient to them in a, in a very narrow and kind of uh, condescending way. But you do need to acknowledge them because there are reasons why they have these and why they have a superintendent or why they have. My recommendation always, always, always is you meet with the leaders of these things privately. Meet with the OOG if there is a pastor fellowship or the Assemblies of God or there is a council of churches guy, which may be, you know, uh, you assume that he's more liberal theologically, but as is often true even with government officials, educational people, and so forth, even if you cannot appeal to their theological desire for salvation and personal redemption and so forth, you can appeal to them on the genuine merits of IWT's focus on young people, uh, the life of families, and those kinds of things, which they, they will always affirm. Um, meet with those people privately, and it may be, if you find that those, there's either some kind of history or relational issues, it may be that you need to bring those leaders together as a kind of separate function. Um, because if you, if you make an end run on those leaders and go directly to the pastors, for example, you go, if there happens to be a, a particularly dominant or influential Assemblies of God Church or Nazarene Church, or whatever it may be. Um, and in many of the places where we are working, uh, you know, say you know, Cape Town, it may be a Dutch reform, or you know, uh, it may be, who knows what it is. Um, if you make an end run around the power structure, then you probably are in trouble right at the beginning. Other questions, observations? Yes, uh, but just one other comment. Um, In the best case, you would love to have these people strongly affirm what you're doing. The minimum of what you want is that they give you permission. Yes. Um, it's interesting as I went through a lot of this when I started the Wyoming Base in Worcester about 10 years ago, uh, and there were such strong structures, the Dutch reform structures, all the other ones, and just looking at some of this, the mistakes I made, things I did right, and where it did succeed, where it failed, and a lot of it was basically not going through some of the right steps. And, and again, there were so many traps there. Just, I mean, it exploded, I mean, a few times. And then there were very strong individuals from different groups. And I mean, they would just take one another on, and I'm like, wow, what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> and you're caught on the crossfire. <laughs> yeah. You're son of a you know, friendly fire. Kaboom. Mm. 
But what I saw, one of the things just on her question too, was befriending, like say, the, the Dutch Reform Circle or that group, befriending one or two of them and getting them and, and sort of knowing, and they will also tell you, probably our whole group's not going to be on board. But by them going, in a sense, they indirectly represent that group. Absolutely. They become and your ambassador. They yeah. become your advocate within yeah. their own peer group. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is that uh, I would urge, even if the only thing he does is give you permission, it's almost like patting you on the head. I was talking about that guy that I went to see three times, you know, nice boy, sort of like your, your best, you know, friendly dog, you know. Um, I think it's, it is always important to ask if they, would they have any interest at least in being informed of what's going on? Because if you take the initiative and say, we want to make sure that you're aware of what's going on because we think it's important that we not be doing things without your awareness. Would you mind if we kept you on the mailing list or informed the email list or whatever it is? Uh, because you never know. You know, you get one or two advocates and they start telling the, the bishop or they tell the other strong DR churches or whatever, and who knows, you know, three months from now, three weeks from now, six months from now, in the process of IWT, they may show up. It may be curiosity, it may be pressure, who knows what it is. Only God knows. Other observations, questions? Just one more thing in this. What helped a lot, there was one guy, um, his name was Eddie Dupree, he was a Pentecostal pastor, but quite senior, and had a kingdom vision, not church vision. And so they respected him, and he was the man of peace. Mm. And so whenever there's something like that, he could bring. But unfortunately, about two years or three years after I arrived, he died suddenly. And, and it was so difficult after that, mm. uh, drawing things together. And, and I just realized how uh, the man of peace he was. Just Let me ask you, what was your, because you had three years with this guy, mm -hmm. what was your impression as a Pentecostal pastor in a hotbed of diversity, but he was perceived as a man of peace. What was it about him that made him? Why was he perceived as a man of peace? Because he didn't have a church. His, his, uh, his kingdom was not his church, but it was the kingdom the, of God. The city. It was probably one of the, in my whole life of being a Christian and walking in church ministry, I've maybe met two people like that. Mm. That when they... They talk, it's not their ministry or their kingdom. It was the kingdom. And everybody knew that. So whenever he draws people in, it, it will not be about my, my church, mm. even though he could have said, oh, I can do it in my church. He never spoke like that. And everybody knew that. And he will encourage everybody in what they're doing. And yeah, I think that was the one thing that made him different from anybody else I've met. One of the marks, I think, um, of maturity is to always be a learner. And I appreciate, Stefan, your comment about the mistakes you made and seeing those things now. And if, you know, all of us say, if I could have started over again, if I could have been a father again, you know. <laughs> the first time on, on stage is the performance. There is no rehearsal. <laughs> uh, and all the mistakes you made. I had an experience last year. I was visiting a very influential uh, foundation, a source of a great deal of money, and uh, my colleague and I were there. These are people I've known for many years. We have a very good relationship with them. We'd gone out to get sandwiches and bring in sandwiches for lunch, and we're coming back into their building, and coming out of the building are four fellows. I had no idea who they were. I thought they were business people, and our host from the foundation said, turned to my colleague and me and said, do you know these guys? I said, no, don't. He said, let me introduce you. He stopped these four guys. We're literally in the doorway, you know. And it turns out that three of the four were guys from a very large church in a neighboring city. I mean, a church of about 20,000 people. It turns out the other guy was from a much smaller neighboring city, about 120 kilometers away. Um, I'd never seen him before, and he, when, when we were being introduced, 
our host introduced me to these guys, my colleague first, and then introduced me. When he got to this guy from the smaller city, who was not with this big church, he looked at me, he had this kind of stunned look in his face. He said, Phil Butler? Phil Butler? Yes, it's like the police, you know, they found you. <laughs> Uh, he said, I've been reading your book. He said, I am so-and-so. Um, my name is Andy Rittenhouse, and I have been leading for the last five years an initiative called Compassion Knoxville, which has been an attempt to bring churches and Christians together to represent Christ and transform the city. He said, <laughs> he said, as I have read, I got your book three months ago, two months ago. He said, as I've read your book, every page I turn, my blood turns cold as I realize the mistakes I have made and why I am where I am. Uh, now, the lovely thing about this man is that we had to go to that city and we sat down it was a really very interesting experience because we sat, I've never had this, no one else has ever, no one, not one. We sat down over this Italian meal and he brought his book. He wanted me to sign this book for him, which I think is always a little strange, but anyway, I signed the book for him. When he handed me the book, the book was two or three months old. It was in rags. You would think it was 40 years old, been passed down through 10 owners. It was absolutely, totally in rags. This very same one that you have, I mean, this is the second edition that you have here, second printing book. And as I opened the book up, page after page after page, underlines, notes in the margin, yellow highlights. Well, two weeks ago, literally now, before it came to come, two weeks ago, the guy calls and he says, we're ready. We're ready. We look back and see all the stuff that we've done and good intentions and good people. We're desperate. We want, to, we want to really do something in this city. Would you and your colleagues come and help us? So being able to acknowledge where we are and move on, you know, learn, is a really important thing. Any other observations? Because I want to go through this thing just very quickly before the break. Yes? Um, I'm very excited about what you're teaching with the whole idea of how to start off meetings and get people to align themselves with a particular purpose. But my, my question is there are times, and I see that usually, especially when you come fresh without a baggage and without history or without hurt in a particular area, and you're very excited about something, you want to have the leaders on board. Number one, they, they have the authority, but most times they're so pessimistic, they're hurting, they're so discouraged and they want to immediately drown you and put your neck under the water just like them. So how do you try to not argue with them or not sympathize and try to encourage them to, to look at the possibilities? Because most times the first thing you get is all the negatives. We know this place. You don't know anything. You just came in. They go on and on and on. What's your wisdom with that? Well, there are First of all, what you say is absolutely true, okay? And, you know, on a scale of positive and negative, every community has some of that. In some cases, it's much more intensive. Other cases, are less intensive. There are some places where there have been wars and battles, and it really has been extremely destructive to the church. Other cases, it's been more private skirmishes, you know, <laughs> small <laughs> firefights. Um, We could talk, speaking of offline, we could talk about that more, you know, over coffee or something, but sometime in the next two days. But um, generally, I think you must acknowledge that. You, if you try to minimize that, you say, oh, well, that's not important. Or we all have trouble. Or I'm sorry, but, but we're talking about something else. They'll say in their minds, no, you can't talk about something else because this is so huge it gets in the way of any other discussion. You, you, uh, 
two things that generally that I've used in the past. One is, do you think that's the way it ought to be? Is that what God wants for us? You know, and they're, they're both at the same time ashamed because they know that it's not the spiritual ideal, yet they're defensive because they're human. There's a reason. You know, they, they're defending the fact that there was this problem or there is this problem. You don't understand. You can't possibly have the hurt that I have or we have or whatever. So first of all, acknowledge. I understand these things may be extremely painful, may be real. Is that what God wants? No. Um, but, of course, then they launch into the buts. We, I'm here to listen, to learn. I need to understand what has happened here, but we're not, we're only interested in talking about the past as it allows us to, in God's guidance by the Holy Spirit, to look at the future. What does God want to do in this community? We're not going to minimize that. You have to be very honest with them. And if you, if you try to minimize it, you know, if I, had a, if I had heard all this garbage going around in Mongolia and had never, ever addressed it, if we hadn't had the almighty meetings when it came Friday morning, because they were going to finish it two or three in the afternoon on Friday, came Friday morning and they were praying and talking and working together, and thinking about do they actually want to form some kind of alliance and set some initial objectives because there are some things they felt by Friday morning they could do better together. They never ever would have come to that if you had not explicitly acknowledged that relational problem. I didn't acknowledge it publicly, but I proactively worked on it. So I think you have to say to the people, look, we understand, it's painful, it's real. And we will take that into consideration. We will take that into account. And as it's appropriate, we'd be glad to work with you on those issues. But brother, you know in your heart of hearts, and we know in our heart of hearts, this is not what God wants us to be looking forward, reconciliation, demonstrating the love and the unity of Christ in this community. So we, we will not trivialize, we will not overlook this stuff. This is, this is why this work is not easy. So you'd like to just come in and say, you know, we have this lovely vision for our city and don't you want to be part of it and, you know, let's all think happy thoughts and... <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just thinking now, because um, in some part of um, Africa you even find pastors or, or leaders who even um, work for their living. And um, in most cases, if you try to, to, to sort of make a meeting so that uh, you can all meet with them and talk to them, a lot of time they'll have uh, an excuse with time. They'll say, no, I don't have time for this. Or, We've tried this before. I, I didn't work. I don't have time. So we, I've got my family. I have to work. I have to rest. And I have to take care of the church. And so how do you actually go to that convenient place where you, you, you convince them that this is really, really a uh, must-meet thing, you know, in a sense that we, we really need to come together in this way. They have many excuses of it. Uh, the truth is, when they say, I've got to work, I have to rest, I have to deal with my family, what they're saying is what we all say, which is, I, I deal with, I take time for the things that are important to me. I do not ascribe importance to what you're talking about. If it was important, I would find time for it. it was, if it was essential for my ministry, if it was absolutely essential for my church, I would find time. The problem is, when you come in, Ndani, when you come in to the city and you're talking to this guy, he doesn't know who you are. He has no idea what value you have. He, has no, he can't per possibly perceive that you're really going to bring any benefits that when you leave town, there's going to be anything left that will really benefit him. Life will go on. He'll have to work. He'll have to rest. He has to deal with his family. has to deal with his church. Why should he take his time with this foreigner, this stranger, who's coming in with an idea? Now, in that town, you know, certainly not all the pastors. I understand that lay pastors who are working and, and even full-time pastors frequently use the same excuse. I have so much to do. I, I do not have the time to meet and talk. 
What they're really saying to you is, what you're talking to me about is not important to me. That's what they're saying. It has absolutely nothing to do with time. And what you have to do, you know, if in that city you have found 20 pastors, and four or five of them are lay pastors who use time as an excuse. They may be full-time pastors who use time as an excuse. What you have got to find out of those 20 pastors is four or five who are respected, who are prepared to go forward. And as they go forward and the thing begins to gain momentum, word goes out. And the pastor who thinks he has no time for this, I cannot guarantee you, but I will, I will say that 25 years of history suggests and experience suggests that they will not want to miss the moving train. If they sense that the train is real, it has substance, it is actually moving, and is going somewhere that has value to the church and may have value to him personally in his ministry. So don't, A, feel badly because he doesn't you know, immediately respond to your invitation to come to a meeting or take time. Find those who do have the capacity, make sure that you continue to communicate with him. Keep the doors open. Proactively communicate with him, saying, this is what's going on, this is what happened at the last meeting, would you please consider prayerfully joining us next meeting? You know, you can't force people. You've got to find, you have to find, if it's, if it's not, you, a man of peace uh, is very important, but you need to find the influentials, and people, if God blesses that, then they want to follow.